Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Inspiring Excellence series in partnership with Danske Bank. Throughout the series, we're offering you the chance to hear from acclaimed leadership figures who all have something to say about dealing with adversity and challenging conventional thinking. This has been a really popular series, and today we're delighted to have one of the best known figures in Northern Ireland, John Healy, OBE. John is most recently the Managing Director of Allstate NI, one of the largest listed property and casualty insurers in the US, and one of the largest professional services companies in Northern Ireland, with 2,400 employees. Previous to Allstate, John held the position of Service Centre Head for City's Near Shore Technology and Operations Centre in Belfast. John is a highly experienced senior executive with 30 years of experience in information technology, mostly gained in the financial services industry, primarily in banking and insurance. In this webinar, John will discuss his leadership journey in conversation with Andrew Toogood and talking about the eight leadership lessons he has learned along the way. Andrew has over 20 years experience in the commercial and non-profit sectors. He has presented to our members before in presentation skills and building a personal brand, so I hope he is a familiar face to many. Andrew's teaching videos and podcasts are currently watched and downloaded many tens of thousands of times in over 70 countries around the world. Andrew will put questions to John after his talk. So as usual, we are really keen to have your input. You can enter questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and Andrew will certainly put these to John. Before we get started, though, I would just like to acknowledge the important partnership we have with Danske Bank which allows us to bring a series of international, highly acclaimed speakers to members and all for free. Danske Bank has been an important partner for us for many years now and have been with us all the way as we've built a strong audience of members for these virtual events. I'd like to ask Johnny Elder of Danske Bank to give a short welcome now on behalf of our sponsor. So over to you, Johnny. Thanks, Emma, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Johnny Elder and I'm part of the senior leadership team here in corporate banking at Danske. I'm delighted to welcome everybody to our first inspiring excellent event of this year in partnership with the society. The focus for today's discussion is leadership and as Emma has alluded there's no better person to talk on the subject than John Healy. There's been no clear demonstration of the challenges and rewards of good leadership um, and the demands that the last three years have placed on businesses and our business leaders. John has extensive experience in leading large organisations through challenging times, and I'm sure, like me, we're all intrigued to hear about his eight lessons on leadership. But before we hear from John, I'm going to hand over to Andrew. Thank you, Johnny. It is my very great pleasure this afternoon to introduce John and uh, Emma and Johnny have both done a great job um, in, in, in setting the scene for us. But I have worked with John as a vendor to Allstate and City and uh, where I first got to know John and, and started to work a bit more closely with him as we were looking at some of the challenges around capacity building, uh, particularly within Allstate. When we, when we talk to leaders, uh, and we talk about leaders, one of the things that we're very quick to do is we're quick to rush to uh, a list of achievements. And uh, one of the really inspiring things about John is, as Emma has mentioned, for over 30 years, he has worked tirelessly on behalf of the people and the economy here locally, uh, promoting the very best of NIPLC. And also in, in Allstate particularly, uh, leading that organization through a significant phase of growth and expansion and creating a space where excellence is the norm. And whilst those are, are remarkable achievements in and of themselves, I, I think today where we're in for a real treat actually is to think about not just the achievements, but what makes uh, the, the best of a leader to create the opportunity for people to really do excellent work. And so I, I have witnessed this firsthand uh, as I've worked with John, where I've seen an excellent leader who possesses like a, a really wide range of personal qualities and personal values that have enabled him over the years to inspire, to motivate, to guide, and to get people to work towards a common goal of excellence. And so 
I really want to encourage you today, listen out for those personal qualities. Um, we're in for a real treat. I have seen vision and integrity and courage and empathy, up close adaptability and resilience, all of the things that go in to making the very best of leaders. And we're, it's a privilege today to have John and to be able to, you know, listen to him as he unpacks his journey. I'd really encourage you to use the Q&A box and uh, to fire the questions through it. I'll be really happy to put those to John uh, as we get towards the end. So enjoy yourself and John, over to you. Andrew, thank you so much. Uh, I, I think I'd, after that build up, it's going to be really difficult for me to, to live up to, to that setup, but I shall do my do my best. And my, my leadership journey, it's been over 30 years, but it really was unlocked for me whenever I was at City. And I got this opportunity to go on a middle manager learning uh, program. Uh, it was over a year opportunities to get together with other like-minded people uh, within the business and, and talk about uh, our, our journeys, our, talk about leadership. And that for me really unlocked uh, my leadership uh, journey and, and set me for the future success uh, that, that I had. And the guy who gave that course, somebody just like you, uh, Andrew, uh, it was a guy called Daryl Abrams. And he said, uh, that one of the most important things that we can do as leaders is help to create new leaders. Uh, and that really resonated with me and is really part of, of my philosophy of, of leadership. And that's why whenever I was asked uh, by Emma to, to come along and talk to this group, uh, that I just jumped at the, at the opportunity you know, to be able to talk about my journey, my career, and then to see whether or not that sparks some ideas, some thoughts, comments and questions uh, that might help you as you start to unlock your leadership uh, potential within your, your career. So hopefully we're gonna do that. I'm gonna talk for about 20 minutes uh, about my career and I'm gonna talk as Johnny said, I'm going to set it out uh, with my eight uh, leadership words, the lessons that I have learned along the way. Now there's no exam at the end of it, you know, so uh, you, know, you, you, you don't have to write down or, or remember the, the eight words, but they're uh, lessons that I have learned uh, along my career and that have helped me uh, to get from uh, my, my you know, start uh, as a, a graduate uh, from Queen's to the seat uh, that, that I occupy uh, today. I'm very happy to take questions on anything uh, that I say here today or anything, uh, any ideas that, that jump into your head, you know, so do use that Q&A. Andrew is going to moderate that uh, on, on our behalf. Uh, and you know, where I can answer the question, I will. Where I'm not able to, I'll be upfront with you and, and say that I can't uh, or, or take, it a, take it away. But I'm going to start right back uh, at, the, at the very beginning as, uh, of, of, of my career. I, I had a really charmed time through school, uh, through university. I graduated from Queen's with two degrees. I did a, an engineering uh, degree. Uh, I, I promised myself on my graduation day that I wasn't going to work a single day as an engineer. I hated it. Uh, I'd been channeled by school into engineering. It was a case of uh, the Latin teacher who didn't have a full time table. He was uh, given a, a couple of extra slots uh, to do careers. And he said, oh, Healy, uh, you're uh, good at maths, good at physics. You'll do engineering. And what did I know? I said, yes, sir, I'll do engineering. Did engineering, hated every second of it. Uh, and uh, I promised myself, as I say, on my graduation, not to work a single day as an engineer. So I, I went right back uh, and got myself uh, into uh, a line uh, of uh, work or you know, study uh, that, that, that I'd always wanted to do, which was to get into to computing. Yeah, I'd always been fascinated by computers, uh, but I also had this fascination with business and I wanted to, to bring the two together. So I went back and I did a, a master's in computing and that got me got me going. But the very first lesson uh, that I learned uh, in, in my uh, journey, uh, and maybe it's a weird one to, to begin with, but it was the lesson of failure. I, I'd come through school, I'd been an A student the whole way through, I'd breezed through and I had two degrees. And I thought, you know, well, hey, excellent. Uh, all I need to do is apply for that first job uh, and I'll be off and uh, going. And way back in 1992, whenever I graduated, uh, there weren't very many 
people doing technology here in Northern Ireland, that, that landscape has completely changed now. Uh, you know, the, the opportunities that are there for computer science graduates are, are immense uh, in the economy in Northern Ireland at the moment. But back in 92, you either got a job with British Telecom or BT, as it's called now, or you didn't get a job in, in, in technology in Northern Ireland. And I applied for their graduate program and I was not successful. And, you know, that was a real shock to me. You know, I, I never failed at anything in my entire life, you know, up to that point. And uh, I had to really dig deep in terms of thinking, well, what do I do next? But it's a very important lesson that I learned early in my career because all of our careers are full of failure. Uh, and it, it is really the mark of you as a leader, uh, how you deal with those setbacks, how you deal with those knocks, uh, pick yourself back up, dust yourself off and throw yourself right back into the, into the fray. So I was lucky that I learned that lesson right at the beginning of my career. And I realized uh, that uh, a career isn't just some sort of inexorable arc of success that takes you from where you are today to, to where you want to be tomorrow, that along the way, there are going to be bumps uh, and you have to be able to deal with those, to have to be able to uh, you know, recover from uh, the, those points of, of failure. So uh, I was uh, on the train. Uh, I'm from Derry. I was on the train one Sunday on the way home for my for my Sunday lunch, as boys from Derry are, are wont to do. I was reading the papers and I saw this job ad for an investment bank in London for a, a technology role. I didn't even know what an investment bank was, but the words in the ad resonated with me, really excited me, and I thought, right, I'm going to apply for that job and, and have a go at it. So I put my application in. I didn't tell my girlfriend at the time that I was applying for this job in, in, in London, but I went off to, to London. Uh, I did the first interview and uh, they said to me, excellent, that was really good. Now we're gonna have you back for a second interview, but if you really want this job, you better go and have a look around and see what everybody else is wearing. Uh, because I turned up in the one and only suit uh, that I had owned at the time. Uh, and I realized that everybody else was wearing really dark blue suits. So uh, I went invested in a, in a dark blue suit, uh, came back for the second interview and got the job. Uh, and that's the job that got me going on my career. It was a job with JP Morgan, uh, the investment bank, working in their interest rate derivatives on their interest rate derivatives desk uh, as the technology analyst. Uh, and uh, I said that, uh, you know, I, I didn't tell my girlfriend at the time. I can tell you that was a difficult conversation whenever I got back to Belfast. But Christine, she came with me uh, and uh, 30 years on, uh, we're married and we've got four kids, uh, all of whom who are out there doing, doing their own things. You know, so that part of it uh, worked out well. But I got going in my career with JP Morgan and I absolutely loved it. Uh, it was really everything I could ever have wanted in terms of bringing together those technology skills uh, that I had acquired through my studies and putting into a really complex business environment and, and been able to you know really show how technology could help to solve real world business uh, problems. And uh, I really thrived on it. It was really hard work, uh, long hours, uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the amount of effort for it, but uh, really enjoyed it. But that's when I learned my second lesson in, in leadership because I allowed my ego to run ahead of itself. You know, here I was, you know, fresh into the investment banking world, doing really well uh, with my particular piece of the puzzle. Uh, and I just thought, you know, that that uh, I had uh, had arrived uh, and that really, uh, you know, JP Morgan, they were lucky to have me was kind of the kind of the mentality that I had. Uh, and I was wondering, well, you know, what's next for me? And my boss at the time, a lady called Deborah Reed and uh, Debbie was just the most amazing leader. Uh, she said to me, John, I have got just the job for you. And I thought, fantastic. Where is it? Where's my team? Where's this massive promotion uh, that I'm going to get? And she said, John, I'm going to put you in charge of business continuity. I can tell you, my heart sank. You know, who, who likes 
doing business continuity certainly not me uh you know i i i didn't you know come to to london or go to london uh to work in a bank to do business continuity but i'm a bit stubborn so i said well i'll show them you know i'll do this job i'll do it really well and then i'll take my labor elsewhere and you know take it to somewhere else where they're going to really value me but as I did that job and you know, we, we got the business continuity plans in place, we passed, the regulators were happy with the, with the job as, as that was done. Debbie turned to me and said, have you learned your lesson? And I had learned my lesson because Debbie was showing me that I needn't get too big for my boots. You know, that I needed, uh, as I was thinking about my career, as I was thinking about not just what I was giving to the company, but you know, demanding what the company was going to do for me, that I needed to show humility. Uh, and you know that has been a valuable lesson for me uh, as I've moved through through my career. You know to make sure that I'm not getting too big from my boots, that I'm understanding what's my part, uh, what's my part of of the machine that I'm uh, looking after, what's my role uh, as I lead the lead the team or lead the organization or make a contribution back into a program. You know I'm, I'm always thinking about uh, you know that from a, a position of what am I giving and not thinking about uh, what is it that I, I deserve or what I, I, I should get from the, from the company. And what I've learned over the 30 years, you know, with that uh, hint of humility, is that actually as you go through and you're giving uh, and given to the company and given to, to wider society, then actually those rewards flow from that. Uh, and uh, that, that, that's where uh, the, the reward element uh, comes for all of us as we're, we're building our, our career. So Debbie was just amazing as a, as a leader and you know, really also spoke to the importance of, of having mentors, having people uh, within the business, uh, people around you who are prepared to tell you things that maybe you don't like uh, or don't want to, to hear. Uh, and Debbie uh, and, and I have, have been friends ever since and, and are still in, in contact to this uh, to this day. But having learned that lesson of, of humility, uh, Debbie then launched me on, on my proper leadership uh, journey, you know, gave me my first experience of not having just to rely on my own excellence and whatever I was able to do for myself, but for the first time to have a team, a small team, uh, but have to rely on others uh, to be good at what they're doing and have that delivery through them rather than me doing the, doing the delivery. And I find that uh, I was pretty good at it, uh, you know, and, and uh, been able to work with, uh, first off, a small team uh, and then a couple of small teams and then a large team uh, and then a number of large teams. Uh, really helping to deliver and develop all of the skills that we all need to be to be successful as we move through the pipelines of of our careers. Learning to uh, be able to manage others, be able to get that delivery uh, from others, uh, and to be able to help others uh, to be successful at, at what they are doing. And that really is the the third lesson in in my leadership journey uh, is one of teamwork. Uh, and for all that we do, uh, we can't just rely on ourselves in terms of getting the, the best outcome for our companies and for our clients and, uh, and for those around us. But actually, we have to work as a team and, and to be able to get the team to function uh, and to be able to uh, deliver that maximum uh, impact. So my career at JP Morgan uh, was going uh, great guns. Uh, I was now uh, running a, a full group. By this stage, I had moved to Glasgow. Um, the uh, JP Morgan had a nearshore development centre in Glasgow. I was running the cash equity delivery uh, development team uh, for them from, uh, from Glasgow. And uh, my career was just going from strength to strength. Um, we'd moved as a family back to Belfast. Uh, by this stage, we had three kids. Uh, and uh, I found myself that I was flying over to Glasgow on a on a Monday morning. I was uh, staying overnight. Notionally, I was working from home in Belfast, a very early adopter. You know, we're all doing it now in terms of home working. Uh, but I, I was doing this uh, back in the in the early 2000s. Notionally, I was working from home on a Wednesday. But more often than not, I found myself flying up and down uh, to London uh, to to the to HQ. Then I would be back over to Glasgow. Glasgow on a Thursday, home on a Friday, weekend be set, Monday over again to, to Glasgow. And all the while, 
you know, I was, you know, being, you know, totally fulfilled from a career perspective, you know, really loving uh, the, the buzz, the energy, uh, the, the dynamism of the sector in which I was working. But I needed to learn my fourth lesson in, in leadership, and that is balance. Uh, because while one dimension of my life was, uh, you know, going exceptionally well, the other dimensions of my life were completely out of uh, whack. And I can remember, uh, and, and it's like, you know, making uh, the hairs in the back of my neck stick up, I can remember waking up in a hotel in Glasgow and saying, what the hell am I doing? Uh, here I am with a fantastic career, fantastic company, doing really well, being really well rewarded, but uh, I'm missing out on a whole aspect of my life in terms of family, friends back home. Uh, and uh, I, I went into work that morning and I resigned uh, and you know, said, no, you know, I, I need to leave the, this job. And four weeks later, I was gone from, from that company. I, I left behind what had been a huge chunk of my life and the energy that I put into my career and it was uh, behind me. Uh, and, you know, that, that lesson of, of balance is something that I've then, from that point, have brought into the whole way that I structure my, my, my work uh, life balance in, in terms of the, 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 the priority that I put uh, onto the different dimensions within my life. And it's not that I don't work at the same rate or give the same commitment or achieve the same outcomes. I just do it in a much more thoughtful way to make sure that I have enough time, enough energy to be able to focus on uh, those other aspects that are really important to us uh, in terms of how we how we lead our, our lives. So having left behind what was a uh, you know, big part of, of my life, and you know, I look back on my time at JP Morgan with, with just such uh, affection, I, I, you know that was just such a, a great company. I then had to learn my fifth lesson in in leadership, and that is around resilience. So uh, I had uh, by this stage uh, three kids, a mortgage to pay, and no job. Uh, and I applied for a job back in Belfast, went through the interview process and, and I got that job. And that job was as a project manager with Liberty IT, who are another big technology company uh, that had, uh, it's a part of a, an insurance company in the US and they had a, a, a near shore center here in, in Belfast. So I, I got myself a job back home, that, that was all well and good. Uh, but I very quickly realized that it was the wrong job for me. Not that Liberty isn't a great company. It is. Uh, but it wasn't the right job for me. And back to that, you know, uh, that word of, of resilience, you know, it's very difficult uh, whenever you're doing something that you don't love in the way that I had loved uh, my career to date uh, with, with JP Morgan, you know, to, to get yourself motivated to, to do your best. But you have to because... That's what gets you your salary at the end of the month. That's what gets you, uh, you know, in terms of making your commitments and, and you know, those, those other uh, elements that, that are important in terms of that, uh, you know, work reward uh, equation. And I sat down with my manager at, uh, at Liberty, a guy called Willie Hamilton. And, you know, Willie and I, uh, you know, have, have spent a lot of time together. Uh, this morning, uh, myself and Willie, we launched what we call the Software Alliance. You know, we have, we have been great partners ever since. And we had a conversation and uh, Willie said to me, John, you need to, you need to go. Uh, and I knew it. Uh, and Willie said, look, you know, let's see what we can do in terms of helping you to, to leave. And uh, I, you know, back again to having great people around you. I talked about Debbie Reed and helping me in terms of understanding my place within organizations. You know, that mentorship, that stewardship, uh, that I got from uh, from Willie, uh, you know, I just just built a, a bond, you know, that that is as strong today as it was, uh, whatever that was, 15, 16 uh, years ago. So I went and uh, at that point I, I applied and, and got a job as the chief information officer 
uh, for a, a local SME for the Grafton Group, which was the largest recruitment company uh, on the island of Ireland, operated all across Europe and you know, had a lot of challenges from a technology perspective. And you know, I went in there uh, and picked myself up and uh, got, that, uh, got that role and, and you know, learned so much uh, by moving out from uh, the, the big corporate world and into the SME sector, you know, very important lesson for, for anybody in business was the understanding that the, 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 the cash flow and, you know, coming from an environment at JP Morgan, where if you could spin a good story, you got the money for the project to where to a place where uh, the two owners of, of Grafton on a daily basis were reminding me that I was spending their children's inheritance. Uh, you know, that that really was, uh, you know, a great, great experience for me in terms of uh, learning uh, in, in, a, in a different part of the economy. And importantly, it also it got me back into a job uh, that I loved and, and, you know, had me back uh, in terms of my, my delivery and back in terms of my leadership journey back on the on the, on the rails. But a really difficult part, part in my career and one where, you know, just understanding the, you know, the need for resilience and being able to deal with the down, downs as well as celebrating the ups uh, is a really important part of anyone's leadership uh, journey. Now, I was about a year into uh, that, that time with uh, the Grafton Group, whenever City opened its uh, development centre here in Belfast. And, you know, I could have kicked myself, you know, saying, oh, the timing, you know, that would have just been the, the, the most amazing uh, you know, thing just to move from a near shore center for JP Morgan straight into a near shore center for for city. But you know, I was enjoying my time with with Grafton and, and learning uh, so much uh, from that that you know I, I didn't lift my head. I didn't go for uh, the opportunity to be part of the setup for for city. But after about uh, three years, and we're somewhere around about uh, two thousand and five at, at this stage. I got the call from uh, from the guys at City. They they've been open for just over two years with two hundred people uh, at the, in this in the center, uh, and they said, "Hey, John, uh, we know that you were involved in a center in in, in Glasgow for one of our um, peers. Uh, we've got the center here. We'd like to have a conversation with you." So I went along and I and I had a conversation with them, and they told me what they. You know what they were trying to do in in, in Belfast, and, and you know I really like the like the sound of it. Uh, but they said, you know, we don't really have a job here, uh, but we'd like you to come and be part of uh, what what we're uh, doing. I remember by this stage I was back in the C suite. I was the the chief information officer for a, a real go ahead uh, SME, uh, and here was somebody saying, "Oh, here's a job. We think that there might be something in it." And that's when I learned uh, my sixth lesson uh, in, uh, in in leadership, and that is one of self confidence. You know, because I knew that I had a great job where I was, but I just knew that there was uh, you know something uh, there, and that I could back myself to turn uh, what was on offer, and they offered me this job. The the title they put on it was to be the business unit manager uh for belfast and you know for the, the 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 quick among you if you think of the three letter acronym that was to be the belfast bum uh, and you know, kind of going okay well what the hell does a belfast bum do uh, uh versus you know, coming out from from being the cio but i had the confidence in myself that i could take what i i knew was a bit of a problem child uh, and be able to turn it into something really special i had that self-confidence uh, to back myself to to go after something that was pretty amorphous uh, and be able to, to to take it on and I did take it on I took it on uh, and you know took it from where where it was at that point two hundred I could see what the what the structural problems were within it I spent a lot of time back and forward to London talking to the leadership there around some of the things that needed to change uh, and then uh, I uh, built it from where it was at two hundred people. To whenever I left it, uh, over two thousand people across operations and and technology, uh, and I moved through from being the Belfast bum to being the head of technology through to being uh, the site lead for that service centre within the the, the city uh, city network, uh, and you know a great journey and one where it all stemmed from having that confidence to be able to grab hold of an opportunity that's in front of you uh, and to be able to make something of it. I, I was at uh, City for eight years uh, and you know, it was going uh, great guns. I could still be there today, you know, in terms of 
uh, that job in terms of uh, being in the position in that position but I got a call from a headhunter uh, and the headhunter said hey I've got this great opportunity at, at Allstate and we think you might be a good candidate uh, for it now as I say I wasn't looking for a job. I was having career development conversations within City around what the what next might be for me uh, within that company. But I thought I'll go along and uh, I'll have uh, a chat and just see what what is happening. It's always good to keep uh, your your options open and find out what's happening in the big bad world. Uh, and I went along and I, I sat down with the chief information officer of the Allstate Corporation, a guy called Saran Gupta. And he was truly visionary uh, in terms of the story that he told, what he wanted to do from a transformation perspective on Allstate uh, and take it uh, through from the, from the uh, position it was as uh, a, a traditional insurance carrier uh, in, the, in the US uh, to one that was technology led uh, and you know, with a with a, a, a revamped platform and and, and driven by uh, technology and and by data, uh, and you know that that's really my seventh lesson in leadership, and that's one of optimism. You know, so I just knew that you know there's always something better out there, uh, and you uh, can go after it and 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 grab hold of it and and make something of it. Uh, and just that story, that vision uh, that uh, the Seren had for the transformation of Allstate resonated really deeply with me. Uh, and that optimism that although I had this great job, this great career was making a real impact from my seat uh, within City, that actually there was a great opportunity uh, on uh, in, in this other company uh, to take uh, what was a good asset within the Allstate uh, family uh, and make it something truly great and make it you know right at the center of this uh, of this uh, transformation uh, and that's what I did I moved and spent seven years uh, with uh, all states uh, and was part of that journey it's very rare in any of our careers that we get to have that opportunity to be part of such a transformation uh, within any company let alone uh, a fortune uh, 100 uh, company uh, and to be able to have that and make that kind of impact from here from home uh, and that was just you know such a, a super super journey and one that was really full of optimism around uh, what uh, could potentially be be better but the eighth lesson and the and the and the lesson the word that I'll, I'll leave you with and and something that has threaded through my entire career, uh, you know, from JP Morgan through my time uh, at, at Grafton in City through Allstate is integrity. It's about having that core set of values that you hold totally dear uh, to yourself. You know, those things that are really important about how you conduct your business, how you interact with those around you, how you lead uh, those who want to follow you, how you make that contribution beyond your company uh, into uh, the wider societies in which all of us live and in businesses that we work for, all of them uh, operate. Uh, and for me, integrity in business in terms of being true to that core set of values, you know, having uh, a set of behaviors uh, that you exhibit uh, in, in, in the way that you conduct your business uh, and that you expect others uh, is something that, that has been really important to me throughout my career. And you know, one of the, the, the best things that, that I've done in my career was part of the, the rollout uh, as part of the transformational journey for Allstate, part of the rollout of uh, the culture transformation uh, within Allstate, been able to actually you know, take something that I've always held really dear and then to be able to help to share that, you know, right across the across the organization and then take that out into, you know, some of the things that, you know, that, that I've been able to make a contribution on outside of my, my day job in terms of uh, an agenda around women in technology, the partnership that I have with business in the, in the community, uh, the work that I do uh, even say today with the launch of this, the Software Alliance in terms of, you know, being able to uh, treat people the way that I want to be treated and know that uh, I'm leaving things better 
uh, today than, than I found them yesterday and that by the end of tomorrow that things will be better again. Uh, and that, and that, that's a philosophy, you know, in terms of leaving things better than I found them uh, that has really served me well throughout my, throughout my career. So, Andrew, uh, that's a whistle stop through my career. Uh, my eight words of failure, humility, teamwork, balance, resilience, self-confidence, optimism, and then integrity uh, are the, the cornerstones uh, of the building blocks that I've used over my 30 years to get me from being that wee boy from Derry on the train home to my mommy for my dinner to where I am today with the experience of, of you know, leadership within large global organizations. And I hope that uh, that has resonated and that there's you know, you know, something there that people can, can think about and take away from this session. But you're the person who's moderating the Q&A, so I don't know whether or not you know, anything that uh, you have heard sparked any thoughts or comments uh, or questions. Absolutely, John. Thank you so much. That, that's fantastic. Um, like I love the the kind of the richness of the journey going from to and fro and 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 how you've um you know many of us are don't have the courage probably is uh, I'm going to come to it sometimes to make those decisions so there are some questions here around that around how you've adapted and and been able to move through but uh, the first question that has come through which is um quite a practical one for you how do you show a company that you still want to progress and achieve success but at the same time, you need to make changes to allow you to have a better work-life balance. Well, that's a, that, that's a really difficult question. Um, the way I showed it was uh, I left, I, I changed it. I, you know, I, back to that word you used it in the preamble, courage. You know, you know, my, my value uh, you know, is, is, is large you know everyone on this call has got a value uh, and if the company that, that that you're working for isn't valuing that appropriately and that includes you know the the, the balance uh, in in terms of work life then my advice is is would be to to change it change it up now i think that uh, you know certainly the companies that i have led you know the likes of city the likes of, of all state are progressive companies uh, and they absolutely see the value in terms of uh, not just recruiting and developing uh, the best talent, but very importantly, in terms of holding on to it. And part of holding on to it is the employer being flexible to meet the needs and demands of the of the employee. Uh, I think that over the last three years, and I think it was you, Emma, said that you know leadership over the last number of years has been difficult. It has. But it's also been really rewarding in terms of learning a lot of really valuable uh, lessons for, for companies. And one of them has how do we manage our companies while being flexible? You know, unfortunately, over the last number of years, it's with people who have been sick or having to, to deal with uh, other things through the through the pandemic. But those lessons are just as, as relevant today. You know, so my, my advice you know, to somebody who is, is, is challenged around uh, how do you get balanced into your life is, is have that conversation with your with your manager you know frame it in in, in an appropriately positive uh, way in terms of you know helping you to continue to contribute to that company in terms of still being part of uh, that company but ultimately if you aren't served by by your company there are plenty of others out there in the economy even at this time where people are are, are worried and maybe about a recession or you know those macroeconomic uh, effects that, that are impacting on us, worried about, oh, it was now a good time to change. Well, you know, if you need the flexibility, then you should, and the opportunities are there. Okay, perfect. When it comes to, we, we've talked a lot about your your values, um, and I think anyone who's listening today will hopefully have an appreciation for those are the values that you build a really great career on and have carried you through, particularly when we look at number eight in terms of integrity. And you've, you've got a lot of experience of, of working with managers, leading people. And, you know, if we, if we, so the values piece is really important, but what would you say to people today who go, well, what are the actual skills? I mean, uh, from a, a senior leader like yourself, what are the skills, the leadership skills, or the most important skills that you would say to people today to concentrate on and to develop um, for their for their own progression and their own career. Yeah, so uh, I mentioned uh, that uh, leadership program that really awakened my my leadership journey, and a large part of that 
was around uh, reading books uh, and, and you know, there were some uh, seminal books that, that, that we read as part of uh, that program that, that gave me a lot of top tips. Uh, you know, the, the, the one we book uh, that I would go back to all the, all the time is a, a little manual written by Dale Carnegie, written back in the 1920s, but just as relevant today in the 21st century. Uh, that's called How to Win Friends and, and Influence People. You know, it's fantastic uh, in terms of uh, a, a, a way to conduct yourself in business, but actually it's really interesting and, you know, even like, you know, going out and, and entertaining clients or at a dinner party, you know, just some of the things there that, that you know, really help you to, to navigate through uh, through difficult conversations and, and get people to, uh, to follow you. And the number one thing in there is listen. You know, you've got to, as a leader, uh, be able to hear what people are saying to you, to be open uh, to their to their challenges, uh, to be able to hear things maybe that you don't want to hear, rather than always be told that everything's green, that everything's all good. Uh, you know, and and you have to you have to be able to 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 do that. Uh, and you know, somebody once put it, you know, that God gave you two ears and one mouth, and that's the proportion in which you should use them. You know, so that's what I'd say to people in terms of. You know, if you really want people to follow you, and that's what it's about, it's about building followership. It's about getting people to do what they maybe don't really want to do. You know, but you as a leader have to get them uh, in, into that space where they're going to uh, deliver for you. It's about hearing what their concerns are and then taking on board uh, and being able to to act on them. You know, so you know that that that's what I'd say in terms of trying to grow that followership is listen to the concerns that people are expressing to you uh, and then deal with them. Okay, and um, when it comes to when you look at some of the rules, I mean, um, growing city from like two hundred to two thousand, all states sitting at big numbers and complex, uh, you know, organizations and leading that there must have been loads of conflict at times that you had to navigate and manage, and it's one of the things that when we're thinking about inspiring excellence in this particular series, one of the things that can take away at that in, in the culture and the environment is conflict because, I mean, conflict is normal, right? And uh, so how, how, did, how did you people, manage? People, people are afraid of conflict. You know, you, you, you sit in, in all sorts of meetings and you just know people are not saying what's truly on their mind. And because they're not, you know, getting themselves into that position of conflict, then you're missing out. You know, you'll see it in terms of your relationship with clients, you know, that they're not telling you what they really, really want. You're not telling them what you really, really need to be telling them because people don't like getting into conflict. Now, I do not seek out conflict. You know, I, I do not, you know, say, oh, great, I'm going to get myself energized by having a, a Barney or a bus stop with somebody. But I absolutely can do conflict and you get a far better outcome whenever you can bring something to the surface, deal with it, and then put it away for forever. You know, where you end up with trouble is whenever you don't uh, deal with that conflict. Uh, and uh, there's a, a, a book, uh, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by a guy called Lencioni. Uh, and there's a, a phrase in it, uh, and, and I just love it because he says, uh, in, in, you know, it's a, it's a story of you know, you know, the, this team and the, the fictional business and you know, what, they're, what they're dealing with in terms of, of dealing with the performance within the business. And in that, he says, it's just one, one sentence, and it says, the absence of conflict is not harmony, it's apathy. And, and really, that, that, that's something that, you know, every time I can feel conflict coming on, I say, if I don't say it, then it means I don't really care about it. And I care deeply about the people around me. I care deeply about the businesses that I run. I care, care deeply uh, about my clients. And I say to myself, you have to say it. You have to get yourself into this position of conflict, because if you don't, it's not that you're saying you agree with everybody. It's saying that you don't really care. Uh, and, and I think that that's something you, if you can remind, remind yourself all the way through, whenever you find yourself in those situations, if I don't say it, then really that's just saying I don't care. And we all care. Everybody in this call cares. You care. I care. Uh, and we owe to ourselves, our clients, our, 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 our businesses to have those moments of conflict and be able and, and able to deal with them. And then be able to to uh, manage the the, the fallout and, and get back onto uh, an even keel. Yeah, and it's a and it's a great skill to develop. 
Yeah, I, I think it's it's critical, isn't it? If you're going to lead anything or if you're going to have any kind of impact or significance in the work that you do. Yeah, I think it was Thomas Crumb, wasn't it, said that, you know, conflict is not really the issue. It's how we deal with it is the issue. And, but it's, it's difficult. I mean, it, yeah. it, it, and you can it. you can disagree agreeably, you know, so you remember that as well. It doesn't mean that you have to have a fight and then you're never going to speak to the person again. You know, you have to find a way to get across that actually I'm not on board with this. I've got a conflicting view get it out there, discuss it, and then realize that maybe you're wrong or convince somebody else that actually you're right, but deal with it. Okay, let's move on. We've got some great questions. John, how do you create future leaders? You get out of their way. You get out of the way. And that that kind of get, kind of kind of brings me to where I am on my journey, you know, in that uh, I went into Allstate and I put a lot of effort into creating leadership. It was a, a super company. They were doing delivering great work, uh, but actually it was incredibly low level, uh, lower value type, type work. And the reason for that is that all the power, all the authority for the decision-making sat in the US. And here were we, this massive center across in Northern Ireland, but actually we weren't having the, the voice at the table. And in fact, we were just ending up being, being order takers. And so whenever I joined Allstate, I realized that you know, in terms of the delivery, all the components were there, but there was a massive gap in terms of leadership, and that was leadership at the top, but very importantly, leadership uh, across the across the middle. I get, you know, all the time, and I'm like, oh, my God, how do you do it? You know, in terms of running a, a, a two and a half thousand person organization, that must be really difficult. The secret, unfortunately, is, and don't share this with anybody, it's really simple, because... You as a leader at the top of this big organization, you're just dealing with uh, 10 or 12 people under you. And what you're trying to do is make sure that they're able to do their jobs to lead the 10 or 12 under them and all the way down through. And very quickly, you're leading an organization of, of, of two and a half thousand. But if you don't have those people underneath you, or worse, if they don't have the skills uh, to be able to lead effectively as well, then uh, you are not going to get the outcome. So that brings you on to, well, how do you do it? Uh, really, you have to stand back. It was a lesson that I learned in that first journey around teamwork is that it's really difficult because you know we're all individually really good at our jobs. And we know that if somebody else comes in to do that job, you know, they're never going to do it as well as you do it. And you, the temptation is always to grab hold of it and say, hey, let me finish that off. Oh, you know, give that to me. I'll, I'll do it. But if you keep doing that, then you're going to have no time, no capacity. So you have to empower others. You have to be able to give somebody a job, you know, watch them fail, even though it's painful to, to do that, and then come in behind and help them to, to recover and, and, and develop the capability, develop the competence to be able to do it effectively and correctly next, next time around. You have to uh, get people on a journey around leadership. You have to awaken in them. Uh, that understanding that they have somewhere to go themselves uh, and, and that you have to then create those those spaces for people to develop. And you know, over the seven years that I was at, at Allstate, hugely successful in terms of being able to develop that leadership capability, get people into those leadership roles uh, to, the, to the point where I felt the real pressure from underneath me of these really talented leaders coming through and saying, well, where do you, where do you go? And for the rest of the organization, you know, it's quite easy in terms of building your career because there's always that next step in the ladder. Whenever you're the chief executive at the top of it and you're looking down at all this capability and competence uh, within, the, within the business and there's nowhere for you to go, like I, I could have gone to the US, that's not what I want to do with my career. And I felt, you know, back to that integrity, you know, for me at that point in my career, it felt right for me to step aside and make space. And the most satisfying thing about you know, that having done all that work and built all that leadership capability is that my successor within that big multinational has come from within the body of Allstate, has come from one of the people that uh, came through and, and that, that I'd helped to create and develop on their leadership journey uh, as well. You know, so uh, and how do you help develop others? You get out of their way. You give them the tools. Uh, you get out of their way. Let them do the job. And where you see them uh, not performing the way that uh, they need to perform, not to be critical, but to be supportive and come in behind and help them to be successful in the way that you want them to be successful. I suppose it doesn't really make sense, does it, to hire really brilliant people and then micromanage them? Tell but isn't them it? But isn't it amazing that that's what businesses do? You know, yeah. and, and you look and, and 
Uh, there's a super book uh, by a lady called Barbara Kellerman, and it's called Bad Leadership. Uh, and I think for all of us who are on a journey around trying to develop our good leadership, it, it's really important that we're able to recognize bad leadership. And, uh, you know, that, that's an instructional manual for anybody uh, in terms of how not to develop your leadership capability. You know, it's a book that's full of stories uh, around where leadership comes off the rails. And it is amazing, Andrew, in terms of, you know, people, you know, hiring in really talented people and then still trying to do the job that you hire them in for yourself. You can't, you've got to have, and it comes back to, you know, some of those other lessons in leadership that I talked about, that self-confidence, you know, that if you do step away from it, your value is going to be recognized in some other way that you're going to have that opportunity with the time that you've now created for yourself by having somebody else in the business with you, have some uh, opportunity to take on and do something else that's going to develop your skills and help you with your career journey as well. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm going to try and roll a couple of questions in, John, um, just a couple more for, for, for time, but we've got a couple coming in, but um, it you're used to um, dealing with, I mean, with with good people and good performers. There's uh, normally a couple of edges around them. Okay, so uh, and that's normal and and not anything particularly wrong. With that so just slightly different to conflict um, in terms of maybe a difference in direction or, or focus. But when we think about personalities, okay, uh, so there's, there's two bits to this question. Number one, how did you keep people motivated? Because even particularly through change and challenge and you know, keeping people in like that culture of innovation. And uh, so how, the question is, number one, how did you keep them? Uh, you know, how do we keep ourselves motivated? How do you keep your people motivated? Number two, when people do clash in personality, this has come in from the floor and you're dealing with really good people on your team, but perhaps they're just not uh, as aligned, maybe might be the way to put it. How, how did you deal with that? So there's lots of lots of different types of, of leadership style, you know, and if again back to you know lots of reading around this, I'm, I'm not sure you know, you know what what they you know what the output is from this kind of session, whether or not there is a reading list. But if there is, I'd put on Daniel Goldman and some of his work around leadership styles, uh, and you can be you know all, all affiliative and do it all in a nice kind of fuzzy, you know, we're all equal. Let's let's get on with it. Or you can be very commanding and. You know, just uh, sit sit in your behind your desk and just tell everybody what you want done. But the most powerful leadership style is to be visionary. You know, to have a really clear view around what it is that you want to do, and then to be able to express that really clearly, uh, so that there's no ambiguity. That everybody knows where we're going. And then people will either choose to line up behind that or sometimes you have to say you're not for this journey. Uh, and, you know, you know, it happens across businesses all the time in terms of uh, you know, maybe some people aren't the right people uh, for that next phase of, of, the, of the journey. But if you are setting out really clearly what you're trying to achieve and people understand clearly what it is that you're trying to achieve and what their role in that will be then you're halfway home in terms of leading and getting people to follow uh, in behind and to be able to really give their best uh, as they as they go for that particular goal so you know what I always try and do is to be really clear in terms of here's the the vision uh, and here's how we're going to move forward towards it get people bought into that uh, and then people uh, will, uh, you know, just, you know, line up and, and they're able to articulate clearly to their people and their people to their people. And all of a sudden you've got the whole machine who are pushing towards that ultimate goal of what you're trying to achieve within your business in terms of sales and revenue, in terms of transformation, in terms of product delivery, whatever, whatever it happens to, happens to be, you know, but definitely it's, it's around uh, the storytelling. And that's what, you know, got me, you know, that, that, that piece around Seren and Allstate and just his vision around transformation. And, you know, that, that's what got, got me motivated for that seven year cycle and, and the delivery that we had was, you know, here's something that I really can combine into. Here's something that I really want to be part of. Brilliant. And, but, um, uh, and that thing about j just the last one in, in one minute, if you wouldn't mind that, that thing of big personality clash or those people around us where we're trying to coalesce around the core purpose of our business or organization, but 
you know, I'm, I'm sure you must have seen that sort of personality sometimes butting heads. Yeah, gosh, we all work. We all work with people who we don't like, uh, and uh, you know, and that and that's fine. The the one thing they they don't tell you in any of the leadership manuals is that leadership at the top of an organization is lonely. Okay, uh, you know, you're you're there. People are looking to you, and you know, whenever you're certainly whenever you reach the top of the organization, there's not very many other places for you to 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 look. Uh, but you know what what I what I learned uh, throughout my whole career is that these are people who you're working with. Uh, nobody is coming at this with bad intent. Uh, you know, people do have uh, differing opinions. But whenever you switch off the lights in the office in the evening or in the attic, as I'm here today, you know, you're not bringing those people home with you. You know, they're, they're not your friends. They don't need to be your friends. You just need to be able to uh, you know, work with them and conduct your business and your relationship with them back to that integrity, treating people with dignity and respect uh, in, in, a, in a way that allows them to do their delivery. You know, you don't, do not in the world of work have to be friends. With everyone uh, and if you try to do that you know I, I wager that you'll just be exhausted and the emotional energy and the expense of that will be uh, quite extreme you know so yes there are difficult characters we, we all have to deal with them uh, where they're part of your journey and where they're making that contribution that you need unfortunately you're just gonna have to rub along with them but where they're not then deal with it uh, deal with them in your business uh, and find some other opportunity for them uh, to go and work on uh, something that is more aligned uh, to what it is that they are able to contribute positively to. Brilliant. John, thank you so much. We're bang up on time. Um, uh, somebody has said, it's not a question, but it's great to see you back in the attic. Uh, <laughs> back in the attic. <laughs> so it's, uh, listen, John, um, I'm going to hand back to Emma in just two seconds. But that, Andrew, that, Thank you very much. Listen, it's been a real treat. I, I think just like just pure gold there for, for anyone who's interested in leadership and excellence. And so thank you for that today. Over to you, Emma. Thank you very much. It absolutely has been a real treat. And again, let me say thank you so much, John, to you and to you also, Andrew, for, for hosting so well. We do really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. And John, for you to share with was what I believe was a really authentic and relatable account of your leadership journey. Um, it has truly been a privilege. I think it is also fair to say you've brought a fresh perspective to the term Belfast bum, um, and maybe a few of us aspiring to be <laughs> to be that bum when we see um, where your leadership journey has gone from there. Um, it does bring to a close today's event. I do really hope that you've enjoyed it and have taken away some thoughts like I have. As usual, we'd really like to hear your feedback on today's discussion with John and Andrew. Um, so I'd encourage you to complete the survey that will no doubt arrive in your inbox immediately after this. We have also recorded today's session. So if you liked it, you have the opportunity to watch it again or indeed to share with your friends and colleagues. The next event in this series is on the 23rd of March. And in that session, we'll hear from Fergal McCormick and Sinead Donovan. So I will look forward to seeing you all then. So again, thank you all for joining us in such large numbers today. We really value your support. And can I just wish you all an enjoyable rest of the day? Thank you.